Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start with a, sort of a history of my history, but also the history of photography. The commonly agreed upon date for the origin of photography is 1839, uh, the year that uh, Louis Daguerre uh, in France and Henry Fox Talbot in England uh, were granted patents for the photograph process. Of course, the photograph had existed in different forms uh, prior to that, and in fact, the um, uh, elements for making photographs, the uh, converging of light in a darkened space, goes back as far as uh, Plato's cave in uh, uh, 830 BC. And as the other component that's required for photography is uh, having a way of fixing that image, and that process for fixing light on a flat surface has existed since uh, the 17th century. So the question is, why did this happen at the same time? Why was it everybody in, in, in Europe, and actually there are many, many people tried to get patents for photography and invented photography in Europe independently. Why was it so important for people to invent photography at this moment in time? I'm not a historian, but uh, so I can make unsubstantiated claims. And my claim is that uh, the reason why it happened when it did is that this is the area of uh, romantic revolutions. This is uh, Liberty Leading the People uh, by Delacroix from um, 1830, celebrating the 1830 July Revolution in France, which established a constitutional monarchy uh, in France. You have the, the youth on the right who's game for anything. Uh, you have the colonial subject uh, on the far left who's uh, looking to a different future. And you have the vanquished down below Liberty who's looking up for inspiration. Liberty looking back at the bourgeois subject who's uh, not really sure if he wants to go where he wants to go. Um, but she's trying to encourage him on to sort of go to a different future. Of course, 1839, when photography appears, is right between this revolution, which was then subverted, uh, and the 18, or 1848 revolutions, uh, which happened all throughout Europe. Suddenly, in Europe, the, the bourgeois class decided that they had a right to determine their, um, the, what happened to their taxes. They had a right to representation um, in, uh, in society. And virtually every country in Europe uh, was uh, subject to a revolution of the bourgeois class, which was very often uh, subverted by, by various means. So prior to this, um, this era, representation was a purview of um, uh, the church and the aristocracy. Uh, my thesis here is that what uh, the these people realize is that they, they, it was possible for them to represent themselves. So this idea of representation was crucial to them. I, I wanna, they want to show their lives, show their way of life um, to other people and to themselves without the uh, mediation of aristocracy um, or religion. Fox Talbot wrote a book called The Pencil of Nature. Um, which was suggesting that his process was somehow natural, that it was just uh, nature uh, describing itself, nature writing itself by combining, again, the optical apparatus and the um, storage device of the, um, of the photographic medium. But photography is actually something stranger than that. It's not something which is necessarily natural. It's actually a, a technical device, uh, which is part of reality. It's part of the real. It's an inhuman thing, uh, which does something ca capture something of reality, but it's definitely not natural. Um, it, is, uh, it shows us things which are very surprising. It was mentioned earlier. It often we show you, th you things you didn't expect that would be there. Uh, the photographer takes an image, uh, and once that image is taken, there's very often something beyond their control which they will finally see once that image is developed. This problematic of what happens between human vision, which is not at all like photography. Often people assume that our, our way of seeing is like a photograph, but it's not at all. We see with our, our minds, not so much with our eyes. Our eyes are only uh, in focus for maybe 10 degrees of uh, the 360 sphere, uh, and our brains are a very complex connection of uh, uh, long-term memory, short-term me memory, pattern recognition, which assembles the image of the world uh, in our heads according to what things mean. It's not just sort of this single gestalt we know from the, the photographic image. But typically, because we are seeing much of the world, our, our past and our present through these technical media, it changes our, our consciousness about uh, how the world is. And my uh, work for the past 30 years has been investigating this, this problematic of how do we, uh, how is our understanding of the world changed when much of our uh, perception of the world is mediated by, the, by this technology? And sometimes we're uh, made to think, we see and think like this technology. Um, a work where I first addressed this was called Overture from 1986, which uh, in effect was the overture to my career, studying the themes which I would be um, preoccupied with for a number of years. I thought it might be a decade or so, but somehow it turned out to be um, the past 30 years that these things have been of interest to me. I also solved a very fundamental problem in, in showing music image, uh, moving image work uh, in, in a gallery, uh, which I forgot for a while, but then, then re-remembered -re and uh, employed as a strategy throughout the rest of my work. I'll show you a bit of this piece from 1986 called Overture, 16 millimeter film projected on a wall uh, at uh, 18 frames per second.
nearly midnight, the hour when an invalid who has been obliged to set out on a journey and to sleep in a strange hotel, awakened by a sudden spasm, sees with glad relief a streak of daylight showing under his door. Thank God it is morning. He can ring and someone will come to look after him. The thought of being assuaged gives him strength to endure his pain. He is certain he heard footsteps. They come nearer and then die away. The ray of light beneath his door is extinguished. It is midnight. Someone has just turned down the gas. So that moment you just saw is very crucial to me and crucial to this piece, I think. It's that moment when the uh, image fades away, and uh, in, in terms of the virtual space, uh, the camera goes into a tunnel, and we're in darkness. But in fact, when you're inside the gallery, you realize for a brief moment that you're looking at a blank wall. You're no longer looking at this uh, transparent image, but you're looking uh, at a thing in front of you. So this is kind of a, a crucial thing for my work, to look at the ways in which um, these media kind of fall apart at a certain point, to look at those breaking points where you are both looking at an image and looking at the thing which produces the image, looking at material as looking at, the, at an idea or something virtual. This is composed of two, two elements. One is uh, uh, a, shot, a film shot by the Edison Film Company in 1899 and 1901 uh, that I bought from the Library of Congress paper negative collection. Um, at that point, film emotion was so volatile that uh, they stored uh, the frames of films in pages of books because it would otherwise be a very dangerous place to um, have, have images uh, stored. So to make this uh, film, they had to re-photograph each page of those, those books to make, make the film. That's combined with um, an equally long book, uh, or, or fragments from an equally long book called In Search of Lost Time by Marcel Proust, and the overture uh, to that, uh, uh, that, that book, which I came to understand by uh, the best from reading Samuel Beckett's 1930 uh, essay on Proust called Proust, where he describes the ideas of uh, uh, voluntary and involuntary memory and habit. And these ideas indeed have been informing my work for, for many, many years. So what happens in this film is we have three sections of film, which you'll be seeing here, uh, which are all accompanied by a voiceover. The, s the film repeats once, uh, and, the vo and the voiceover changes, or continues to change, although certain words, certain phrases um, are, the, are the same, so you're not quite sure if you've seen this before or if it's, if it's looping. You, you recognize the imagery, but the, the text is similar but somehow different. Again, something I stole from Samuel Beckett and his uh, play Waiting for Godot, in which you have two acts which are the same but different in some way. But this, the, the text is always talking about how the character is in between waking and sleeping states, not sure if they're asleep or awake, just like the viewer inside the gallery. He is not sure if they're looking through the wall at an image or if they're looking at the wall in, in some, some way. Oh. Um, so a, a few years after this, I began working in the medium of television. I was never precisely a video artist, um, even though I did work with video. Um, I didn't work as an artist who would get a video camera and dis determine what I could do with that camera. Um, I began by working directly with the medium of, t of television. So it was not so much as to retain a connection to te television that many video artists were concerned of at this point, uh, often trying to do things on, on public access TV, um, but I wanted to work directly with the medium of television. I did this by making um, something which George Lewis has called um, counterfeit advertisements, where I used the medium of uh, TV and, and commercial TV and the format of uh, commercial broadcasting uh, interventions in TV um, to, in a way, interrupt the habits we had in, in that era of watching TV. Of course, there are historical documents now, and as much as we don't see TV in that way, and we, the habits that I had myself had developed in order to uh, be able to uh, ignore the, the flow of these uh, advertisements while I waited for the programming to come back, um, that's not the way we see, watch TV anymore, but, but that then it was, it was kind of necessary. But I realized that, um, in effect, as Richard Serra has suggest, suggested, that the real content of, of broadcast TV was not the programming that we were there to see, but the advertising, the thing which paid for the programming, because we were given the seduction of the programming in order to be sitting there and watching these ads. But as we watched these ads, there was a kind of a, a sort of pr a perceptual habit of uh, blanking out, I would find, where I would somehow ignore it, but I wanted to find a way, way of breaking that, so I made these counterfeit ads things which uh, had the, the same means of production as advertising. They're all shot in film, uh, edited onto one-inch videotape, and then broadcast with ads, like ads, uh, with late-night TV. Uh, I did one series in 1988 called Television Spots, another series in 1991 called Monodramas, uh, which I'll show you an example of now. Here's one, one of 10 monodramas from 1991. Uh, these ad, sort of counterfeit ads from, uh, for broadcast TV shown um, as many as one per night, as many as um, eight times that night. 
um, broadcast in a number of places, including uh, Vancouver, uh, sponsored by the um, UBC Gallery, Fine Arts Gallery um, in, in, Van in Vancouver on BC TV. Here's one called I'm Not Gary. Hi, Gary. How you doing? I'm not Gary. Gary with a punchline, sorry. Um, so when I made this work, I had actually been working as a photographer at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, I was doing reproduction work, photographing paintings and sculpture, and installations uh, for, for the gallery's publications. And uh, I acquired a 4x5 camera, something I was using at work. Uh, I never actually used that camera to make um, art before, but when I was sort of preparing to make uh, the TV spots and monodramas, I began doing location shots, uh, often from the angles I was using or sort of a general, um, to get an idea of like the framing I would, I'd be using um, in, in the final work. Um, unfortunately, people got the idea that my photography in general was location photography uh, for my, my film and video work. Um, uh, it certainly was when I made the modern dramas. It certainly was when I made a, a piece called Pursuit, Fear, Catastrophe, Ruskin, BC. Uh, but after that, I tried to make my photographs uh, in a way a, a separate but coherent body of work. Not um, a supplement to the, these films, but actually a, a separate work. And that was often misunderstood. People always assumed my photography was secondary, even though it was primary to me. Uh, for some reason, when I made these f f photo series, it was usually connected to works that I shot on film, uh, even if that sh film was eventually uh, on video, like Mukha. Um, this was done in 1995. Um, uh, this is a, a view of the um, Rotekazerna at Leibniz at, uh, in a place called Potsdam, looking at the Schreber Gardens around there. These are allotment gardens, uh, which you find uh, throughout Germany, and they even existed in, in East Germany at a time when, during the DDR time, when it was supposed to have no personal property of this sort, like a, a, in, on, on land of this sort. This was still handed down by family legacy from place to place. It was so, an, such an important part of the culture. This was uh, st still retained. So that was kind of like looking at the transformation of this uh, culture uh, in East Germany as Western capital is coming in to uh, turn the area of Potsdam and Wannsee into a resort area again. Uh, this is a place called Resolution Cove, where um, uh, Captain Cook uh, first encountered uh, McQuinna, or I guess McQuinna first encountered Captain Cook, uh, this contact between natives and Europeans on the west coast of uh, uh, Vancouver Island, looking over at uh, Mount Adair. Uh, this was uh, a series of works called Nuka Sound, uh, exploring the different senses of interventions of human beings in the landscape, both in industrial uh, presences, 19th century European presence, as well as the thousands of year old native presence, indigenous presence uh, in this landscape of Nuka Sound. And this is from a series called Detroit Photographs from uh, 1998. Um, sorry, yeah, yeah, 1998. Um, in which I tried to photograph the uh, psychogeographic -geog borders of uh, Detroit. Detroit is a, a city that has been kind of devastated by um, uh, industrial, or uh, actually the flight of capital from, from the city, uh, and many people um, left the city as well. There's an epi epidemic of, of house burning uh, for a period of time, which left a lot of the um, uh, residential areas uh, quite empty. Here you see a recently burned house, and on, on the right, uh, there's a home that's been sort of a, with a manicured lawn. Other side, there's a, uh, another lawn that's been cut by the city to uh, prevent uh, garbage from collecting. But um, this series of photographs documented the way in which um, this very iconically industrial city was being almost turned into a, a rural city um, because of its uh, de depopulation over time. Um, this is a, a thing called the City Majestic, but also uh, converted into a carpentry shop by the Ministry of Culture in Havana, Cuba, uh, to, to uh, renovate and repair uh, heritage buildings in the, the downtown city in, in old, old Havana. Uh, a series of photographs I did which were, uh, in effect, looking at repurposed places, places that were, uh, had been one thing at one point, being transformed into something else, but not quite transformed all the way to that, that new thing. So, in a way, looking at a, a dialectical situation, much like Cuba itself, which is a, a, a repurposing of a, a city, a repurposing of a nation uh, through a revolution, but in, like Cuba, not quite exactly where it wanted to be, but kind of stuck in this sort of in-between space. 
Uh, this work is from uh, 2006, uh, from a series called, called uh, the Western Photos. Uh, it kind of traced the Glo Gold, Rush, Gold Rush Trail from uh, Vancouver up to a place called Barkerville. This is a place called Valachin, which is a, had been a utopian community in the 19th century that kind of um, uh, fell apart because they couldn't get fresh water uh, to the area. In the foreground, we see a farm. Uh, in the middle ground, there's uh, the Thompson River, kind of classic uh, Victor Victorialist painting, or painting type uh, scenario. Behind that, there's a, a very curious town of uh, trailer, park, uh, trailer Park with uh, Trailer Park homes, mobile homes, and beyond that, a, a, a mountain is being sort of uh, carved away for uh, mining the minerals within. Another photograph, which is from the same series, but really belonged to a later series that I did call Interiors, uh, in which we see a place where somebody has lived for either years or, or, uh, or decades, uh, deciding where things go, sort of building an, an environment for themselves. And in a way, you're looking at the inside of somebody's brain. Um, in the middle, you see the desk of uh, this uh, place called um, McLeod's Books, and Don Stewart, who owns that, who would sit in that chair, Basically, it looks like a mess, but he knows where exactly where everything is. So it's kind of this, this kind of strong, strange situation. Um, so those various series were connected to research I was doing uh, on various film projects, even though I do believe that they were uh, separate bodies of work. One which is um, uh, undeniably uh, singular is this uh, piece, which is in the exhibition uh, called Every Building on 100 West Hastings, uh, which documents um, that strip of um, West Hastings in Vancouver, which is a buffer in a way between uh, Skid Row um, on the east and more gentrified parts of the city on the west. And we see the, in a way there's almost a uh, economic dissolve from one condition to the other as you move across uh, the space of that, um, of, of that picture. But of course, in a condition where a, a city block is allowed to go fallow like this uh, before it can be exploited by, by capital later on, it does have other uses, often by artists who will be using the space in different ways. So, for example, all the way on the right is, a, is a, the old province building where I had a studio for a uh, number of years in the 1990s. Um, uh, two doors down, there's a white building. On the top floor was the um, collective, uh, the Kootenai School of Writing uh, had a studio there. And in fact, I entered a book called Vancouver Anthology in that same space. In the middle, but on the sidewalk, there's the Dynamo Artist um, Studios. Uh, all the way, uh, the third body from th third building from the left is the old Perel uh, building, which had been the home of the Ore Gallery, artist-run center for a while. And above that, studios for uh, San Francisco University. Uh, that's where Jeff Wall shot Picture for Women, and that's also where I had studied with Mary Kelly and when she was in, in Vancouver doing a, a seminar briefly. Of course, now this is completely different. It's gentrified. We have uh, caf uh, coffee shops, uh, restaurants, uh, yoga studios, architect's office, uh, a very different situation now that the uh, economic pressure in the area is uh, quite severe and the, uh, the, the sort of demands of gentrification have changed it uh, quite considerably. This was shot by taking a number of photographs, 21 ex different exposures of each facade, and then stitching them together in, in Photoshop to make this one 16-foot-long uh, panorama. So in a way, it's a kind of a uh, exploded panorama in as much as it's not based on a single central perspective point, but actually many points and then sort of spread open, uh, flayed open like this, this large, wide photograph. Now, you could also consider this to be at the point of view of the building across the street from it, and that building uh, is this one, the Woodward's building. Uh, this building was built in 1903 and then elaborated. It became uh, a bigger building over time. And it had been kind of the working class, middle class um, uh, sort of destination for, for shopping. That's where Santa Claus would be, that where a bridal registry would be for um, the sort of lower working class people um, of Vancouver. Uh, this was shut down in 1995. And um, there's a lot of sort of contest because of the um, new economy of big box stores in the, the suburbs um, that sort of like the, the eroded the, um, uh, the profitability of having a, a department store here. Plus, the neighborhood was changing based on um, the kind of uh, containment of vice and poverty uh, in this area of the downtown east side of Vancouver. So they closed it in 1995. And there was a contest as to what would happen with the building. And there were, in fact, squats of the, the building uh, in 2001, where uh, uh, lower-income people in Vancouver who had no place to live, were homeless, uh, wanted to uh, sort of have some uh, voice in how it would be transformed in some way. Um, eventually, when it was developed, it uh, included both um, uh, retail housing and public housing, which was the demanding in the first place, plus the Arts co uh, College of San Francisco University and um, uh, uh, a number of cinemas for a theater, a cinema, a drugstore, and grocery stores. So it's in, in a way this little village. So both trying to 
um, have some, uh, allow the effects of gentrification to be um, somehow mediated by this, but still it is a sign of this just transformation of that whole neighborhood. I was asked to make a mural for this dislocation, and so rather than to do a, a public artwork that would be decorative or celebratory in some way, I wanted to pre present a kind of problem. And I did that by staging a riot which took place in this neighborhood in, in 1971, uh, called, typically called the, the Gastown Riot, which was um, a very elaborate uh, staging. It's like we um, actually built uh, all the environment there. We went to a parking lot, laid down blacktop, put up facades, uh, poured, the, poured the, um, the sidewalks, built the, made the garbage, like the, soup, the newspapers are, are period newspapers, the uh, popcorn containers, crackers that containers are all uh, are period and built for, uh, for this purpose um, to make this very complex image, which is a, a wall of the atrium in the center of that Woodruff project. My contention is that this um, event, this, this gas town riot, is the cause of the decline of that neighborhood because uh, the city had a, a choice of either developing a place called um, uh, Granville Island, uh, a, a, a few miles away, or this neighborhood of Gastown into a new, sh a new shopping area. After the riot, in which the uh, police had been uh, basically harassing hippies who had moved into industrial spaces, um, living where they weren't supposed to live, and then um, they'd find them in these working class bars and, and sort of would uh, tell them they, were, they, shouldn't, they don't belong there, they shouldn't be there. These hippies, being entitled middle class kids, thought they could do what they wanted, and so they uh, had a festival on, on the street. And um, where they gave out popcorn, watermelon, had a 10 foot long paper mache joint, um, and, uh, and, and, and rock music. At 10 o'clock, the cops decided, or the police chief decided they, enough was enough, calling the riot squad, and uh, this, this riot ensued, in which um, everyone was kind of terrified. You had cops coming in from the, the east, reservists coming in from the west, as we see here. This is about a block away from the epicenter of the riot and then water was to the north, so there's a sense of like uh, containment and confusion was going on. Plus these conflicting interests of the cops was to, to on one hand clear the streets, but on the other hand to uh, arrest the um, sort of uh, what they call the troublemakers who were um, uh, either they thought selling drugs or uh, were suspicious characters. That's why you see um, per people dressed as hippies with um, riot sticks and helmets um, who are there arresting various people uh, in this image. So in a way, that empty space in, in the, the center is emblematic of this idea of like emptying and, and clearing out the, um, uh, the, the street or the civil space here. Uh, this was the cause of, um, again, a change of the neighborhood, but also uh, it did turn into a, a case where the uh, police policies were transformed by this, this event. And uh, uh, riot, riot, police riots like this have not happened again in Vancouver. But um, instead of having a, a celebratory image in this case, as I said, I wanted to present a problem, a historical problem uh, with this. And I've, if I go by, I often see people looking at it, like wondering what the hell is this doing here, and asking questions as to why this is, uh, why such an image is in this location. So, just a, a ways of keeping that, that story alive. This is an image from uh, the 1940s, which I, I found, which I had no idea what it was because it's uh, a building that was had just disappeared before I was born. It's called the Second Hotel Vancouver. This was a. Um, Sort of, uh, it built on the side of the first Hotel Vancouver, and on the right you see the third Hotel Vancouver. This, the second building was built in 1916 and lasted until 1949 when it was torn down. Um, the third hotel was built in 1935, kind of as a make-work project during, during the Depression, uh, but also as a way of making the various people involved uh, a lot of money. So the older building, in a way more grand building, was, was left vacant. When soldiers came back out of the war, they had no place to live, and they began squatting it um, and until it was torn, torn down in 1949. So in a way, this location becomes emblematic of the transformation of uh, North American cities in the post-war period. Number one being the uh, suburbanization of the middle class. These, these soldiers eventually got uh, home, subsidized homes in suburban areas. Uh, but also uh, this project, which was uh, connected to Mid-Century Studio and a play did called um, Helen Lawrence, connected to what happened uh, on the east side with the uh, clearance of uh, uh, slums and the, the so-called idea of uh, urban renewal. <coughs> this is uh, the man on the upper right-hand corner, is uh, Raymond Monroe, uh, the inspiration for um, the photographer in Mid-Century Studio, but later, at this point, 1955, a, a journalist um, who heard stories about corruption of the police force, which would not be published by the local press, but he was able to get it uh, published by this tabloid um, in, in Toronto called, called Flash. Rave of Vancouver, Monroe tears the mask from Crooked Law and Gangland Eden. Um, so, and you see this sort of very film noir image there. So both that photograph and this, um, this story, which I'd heard about years ago working in an archive, um, 
made me think about Vancouver as being part of this film noir world. And I had an epiphany, which um, is probably obvious to most people, in that the, the behavior of people in film noir is somehow connected to uh, the trauma of war. People have been at war, they've killed people, see people die around them, or they've been home uh, in uh, states of um, uh, deprivation where they had to do things they're not very proud of to get by, uh, to make money. And so this, uh, the manipulative character of the uh, femme fatale and the stoic uh, silence of the, the tough guy is probably connected somehow to post-traumatic stress. And that's kind of like uh, became a theme in these, these various works I was doing, both Mid-Century Studio, uh, an app called Circa 1948, and a play I did called um, uh, Helen Lawrence. So what um, Monroe revealed was the corruption of this man on the left, Walter Mulligan, who was the police chief, the youngest police chief in, in Vancouver's history, um, who after the war thought that um, everything is as the way it was during the war and that everybody could be a little bit, little bit crooked. Um, he had this idea of uh, having fewer uh, vice operations in town so you could make um, one collection after one big operation as opposed to smaller collections off of smaller operations to make his, his life easier. Um, unfortunately for him, he told an honest cop about his plans, who revealed to the mayor. The mayor disbanded the various, like, did some investigations, thought who knew about this, and then disbanded the various vice squads in, in town. But uh, Monroe heard about it and brought it up in this inquest took place, of which we see Mulligan here, um, in which the colorful nature of Vancouver was made very clear over time, including Helen Douglas, uh, who was allowed to appear at trial in disguise um, uh, during, during the inquest, who was his East End mistress. He had an East End mistress and a West End mistress, and he would typically launder money by uh, buying them properties and then selling it um, uh, at a loss later on. Um, this guy is, is Jack Whelan, who's probably the source of the leak, uh, and probably told Monroe, who's kind of this sort of crazy nut, he'd work as, as a, he was in, in, the, in the Army during the Battle of Britain, or Air Force during the Battle of Britain, um, a ph photographer, as we know, uh, in the post-war period, kind of like had this idea of going and saying, I've got a camera, I'm a photographer, and it took a while to learn what the craft was over time, but then became a journalist, and his, part of his idea was to, um, uh, his practice was to learn hypnotism so he could actually get better uh, information from people. Um, but in fact, he was also kind of a scary character as well. He always carried a gun. And um, uh, uh, this guy's brother, who was the chairman of the police squad, committed suicide uh, instead of getting, giving testimony because Monroe threatened him to reveal to the city that his daughter was autistic. And rather than feel, feel that shame, he killed himself. Anyway, uh, Whelan told the story to Monroe. Monroe to, uh, published it in the newspaper. Everything came out. And the inquest was like this vast kind of archive of uh, uh, the uh, Kruger shenanigans uh, in Vancouver in the period, which was the base of my research for um, the play and for those photographs. Here is, a, again, an image of the hotel, which we'll see in the exhibition. Um, derived from the media we made for the play, I thought it'd be easy to make, but actually it was quite complicated to make this. It took about half a year to, to build this image. It's made, completely made by hand. The building does not exist. So from fragments of uh, drawings and photographs, we constructed this, this uh, version of the hotel. This is Hogan's Alley, uh, which is the East End location that this features uh, in the app and in the play, uh, which was sort of legendarily a black neighborhood, but really, in fact, a black Italian and Chinese neighborhood. In fact, they called the, um, the school there the League of Nations because basically anybody not uh, Anglo-Saxon Protestant was um, made to live in, in this area. So the, it's a Jewish neighborhood, Italian, Ukrainian. Uh, so many languages were spoken uh, in the Strathcona school. Um, but down the way is uh, something called um, uh, Buddy, Bl Buddy White's beer garden. Buddy White was a, a black man who got white, white hair at a very early, early age who was one of the main um, sort of uh, kingpins of, of this, this neighborhood. So the play I made, Helen Lawrence, in a way is looking at the seams that I, that I talked about before, the oscillation between um, the materiality of what you're seeing and some kind of virtual image. Uh, Helen Lawrence is a, a feature film which uh, happens in real time, happens before your eyes. We're watching the cast uh, perform uh, on stage on a blue screen set, um, and each actor takes turns running these, uh, these video cameras. The cameras were attached to computers which track where they're looking and they match the, those motions exactly to uh, uh, synthetic backgrounds of what's, uh, where they should be. So we see them um, on stage through a scrim between the audience and the stage uh, performing. Um, the blue screen is, is taken out and the background is inserted in the back, so it kind of feels like we're in this virtual space. The story's called Helen Lawrence, named for this woman who's uh, 
um, come to Vancouver to uh, find her ex-lover who had um, killed her husband and left her to take the blame in, in California. Um, but she's, in a way, her, she becomes a witness to the various social conditions of, of Vancouver. The real main character is the one we see from behind here, Buddy Black, who uh, has the most um, stage presence, uh, everybody's connected to in some way. And he's trying to take his uh, little empire from Hogan's Alley and make it legitimate because he knows the area is uh, sort of slated for demolition because it's thought to be uh, a place of moral turpitude. Um, this man on the right is the one that uh, Pellin is looking for. Um, and when Buddy realizes that he's going to betray him by, to the, uh, with the police chief and not allow him to sort of open legit business, um, he encounters him and then tells Helen Lawrence where, which train that uh, this guy is taking um, to, out, out of town. And then at the, the final moment of the play, they encounter each other. So to give you an idea what I mean, I'll, I'll give you a, a sense of how this works. Uh, here's a, a, a little clip from uh, the play Helen Lawrence uh, from 1994. It's all big shot, huh? Newspapers. No kidding. So, Ray, what? Uh-huh. 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 So, Ray, 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 Ray uh, uh, back up. So, when was this exactly? Well, can you get me the details and call me back? All right, thanks. So, what's the lowdown? Nothing much. Except when I go in there, I knock, no answer. Uh -huh. There she is, laid out on the bed, bottle of whiskey in one hand and a bottle of pills from some bug ward in L.A. Said so right on the bottle. Right. She asked you about Percy at all? No, what's he got to do with her? You just, you just keep that to yourself. Why? Just you stay away from Percy. I, I don't want you talking to him. Why not? And don't let her know that he's downstairs. We've we got to keep those two apart for a while. Here. Take this. Oh, that's mighty. Why do you, boss? Not for you, for her. Go on and uh, and uh, tell her it's uh, it's with my compliments. Yeah. <laughs> this ain't gonna do it, you know. You can't hit what she's pitching. This won't even get you close to first base. You won't even get out of the dugout. Beat it. I'm just trying to save you from another humiliating humiliation. <laughs> Taxi service. Yeah, yeah, I just called you. We, we need to settle up. But I'm moving the office over to the Dodson. <clears throat> yeah, we, we, yeah, we got the liquor license. Uh-huh. It is. It's a big, big step up. You ain't kidding. But listen, you, you bring that money over here today. You want to stand? Before six. All right. Jesus fucking Christ. Morning, Sergeant. What are, you, what are you always sneaking around for, well, huh? How your, long you been there? Don't get your shorts in a twist. I already knew about you and Buddy going for the Dodson. Congrats. Yeah, another fucking headache. Yeah. Uh, Percy, listen, I got a sure thing. Edward, the, the answer is no. Take a walk. Go on. <sighs> what do you want? Well, it's about the Dodson, now that you, you happen to bring it up. What about it? I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, to, to come along on that. <laughs> come again? Well, the Dodson is a legit beer parlor. You are going to have to start keeping a couple of sets of the books. You need a manager. I need the work. But I am a good front man. That's, that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a decorated officer. I make a good show. That's, that's what I did in the Army. Anytime anybody needed something pulled off with a little class, they came to me. Yeah, I heard you were pimping for the officer's corps. Yeah, well, that's, that's sweet work if you can get it. <laughs> so what's the worry, huh? You won't starve. You can always turn your little chicken Julie out for a buck till something comes along. It's not like that. Yeah, what's it like? It is not like that. It sure looks like that. <clears throat> um, yes, goes on and on. Uh, Around the same time, or more recently, I've been doing a, a multi-platform project uh, around the Portuguese Revolution, um, uh, Disco Angola, uh, Luana Kinshasa, and The Secret Agent. Uh, so the first one I'm, I'm showing you now is uh, from Disco Angola, um, which kind of resumes this idea about uh, historical photog photography, but not exactly assuming a character um, like I had done in, in Mid-Century Studio. Um, my interest here is more that um, two things could have been witnessed by people at the same time. And in a way, things which are very, very different, um, in a way, have a s very, very um, similar uh, aesthetic feeling to them. And this is the uh, somehow some local private condition 
of often freedom or liberation is being interfered with exterior forces that want to uh, be involved with that or control that somehow. Uh, in the case of the Portuguese Revolution, or in the case of Angola, which was liberated because of the um, revolution in Portugal in 1974, uh, they had their Independence Day on November 11th, 1975, and here we see many of the col colonialists uh, going back to, to Portugal. Um, the MPLA, who was the um, kind of Soviet-aligned uh, group in, um, in Angola, um, was able to retain uh, control over Luanda. Um, um, but at the same time, the other groups, the FNLA in the north, you did in the south, were being funded by South Africa, uh, China, um, often using uh, Belgian uh, mercenaries, British mercenaries, and um, funded by the CIA. So this, in, this a civil war ensued after that for about 18 years, uh, causing great devastation uh, to the people and, and to the land. And there's, I think, like 30,000 landmines still in Angola, which makes it a very, very dangerous place to be. Uh, anyway, uh, what could have been um, a kind of a, a recreation, the liberation of a, a colonized country in Africa um, was turned into this proxy Cold War a situation um, over that um, 18 years. And now this sort of very corrupt um, uh, petrol economy. So in this we see that sort of a collection of things in a way, a condensation of uh, many photographs I saw of the colonists who are leaving with things they can't take away, like that goat's not going, chickens aren't going, dog might go. Um, but all these people will probably go, maybe not all their belongings. Um, a couple of Ang Angolan wines being given some instruction by their, um, their, their sort, of, sort of a man who is uh, being looked at with some amusement by the uh, men on the, uh, the far left-hand corner. All these kind of micro scenarios taking place uh, in the situation of people who are basically bored and waiting and uh, uh, hoping to, to escape, to find some way of escape from this. So um, in a way, a parallel escape uh, from the um, escapists that we have in this, this image of Club Versailles. Um, this is, in a way, looking at what happened to the disco underground, which kind of began around 1972 uh, in New York City, uh, taking place in um, a, a sort of very derelict hotels in midtown Manhattan, as well as lofts in, in Soho. Uh, people realized this, these were rentable, and New York was a very sort of uh, impoverished and dangerous place on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, many many uh, sort of youth gangs were roving the streets. Uh, but nevertheless, in these locations, you had these uh, various diverse mix of people, black, white, uh, Latino, um, uh, gay and straight, uh, dancing and farting to a music that was a combination of um, just sort of the right kind of vibe in uh, R&B music, uh, African music, and, and Latin music was played by, by DJs at the time, very often Italian DJs uh, at the time. This is kind of a, a fictional place that, was, uh, we, uh, that I'm calling Club Versailles, but it's kind of indicative of what was happening in many of the, these clubs. So that's the kind of aesthetic parallel I'm making between the two cases. Is that this, um, um, the images often will have a, a thematic or a vis visual rhyme, um, but the, the whole general project is about how something which could have been utopian was, was destroyed by uh, a larger fa power or force trying to participate or be a part of it. This image is called um, um, Road, road, check? road uh, Checkpoint. Um, that was inspired by a book called Another Day of Life by Richard Kapustensky, who's a journalist, Polish journalist, who went to Angola as every other journalist was leaving. He tells a story about coming to a checkpoint, which would be in the middle of nowhere and, and kind of nothing in a way. There's just like a, a rope. You could obviously drive around it. Um, but what you see, if you look closely, are, are uh, five, five different snipers who are hidden among this thing. So what would happen here, he said, is that if you get to a checkpoint, depending on if you, if you said, Hola, hello comrade, or hello brother, was the difference between life and death based on who these people were because they had no normal uniforms, just had sort of random clothes they wore all, all the time. This is an image called Coat Check uh, from the disco part of Disco Angola. Uh, very expensive items which are being left out, sort of indicating the uh, sense of trust between all the people who are there. This is an image called uh, Luta Continua uh, from the Angola part with the MPLA flag and a, a very fashionable, well-dressed and probably privileged uh, 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 young woman um, standing in front of it, ironically. This is two friends from, disc uh, from the disco side again. Probably a, a couple of straight people who thought they would want to be um, involved in the, these, this disco club, but finding out the uh, behavior there is not something they were actually that comfortable with. The other part of the sort of the next sort of project, which was connected to this um, whole moment, it was is called Luana Kinshasa, um, and through that title, I kind of want to give a sense of what the date is. Again, the liberation of Luanda in 1975, and of course the rumble in the jungle, which happened uh, the same year um, in Kinshasa. Um, this, in a way, is an elaboration of my, one of my favorite records, uh, On the Corner by Miles Davis, which was uh, made in 1972. 
Um, Miles thought that somehow a combination of uh, jazz funk with Indian classical music would be a great hit with the kids. Um, but it was his worst selling album ever. <laughs> um, primarily because they tried to market it towards um, uh, the jazz audience who had no idea what this, this was, which was a very long, extended, freewheeling jam that so would sort of go on for a long period of time. Um, but we see the sort of the, the African allegiance and the, and the colors we see on, on the, the buttons and then the t-shirt there. And my thought was that if um, maybe if Miles had actually made more studio records past this, because um, the records in the um, 70s tend to be live records after this, this period, uh, he may have hooked on to what was the biggest hit in the disco underground. That was a record by Mano Dibango called um, Sol Makosa, which is on this album, um, Oboso. And if you listen to side two of this record, there's a lot of allegiance between what um, um, Dibango's synthesis of uh, Cameroon music um, from his native Cam Cameroon, uh, plus what he knew about um, a jazz funk that was happening. So they, in a way, would make a lot of sense to connect. So what I do in this piece is connect the two um, in, a, in a very uh, interesting fashion, I think. The next element is like, where are we? How, how, do we? how do we stage this? How do we make this thing happen? And I, I chose a location called um, The Church, which was the uh, 30th Street studio of Columbia Records um, that was called The Church because it had been a desacralized church, which was uh, one of the favorite recording studios of Miles Davis. And here we see Roscoe Mitchell recording a 1975 album called um, The Maze, a 76 album called, called The Maze. Um, so based on the look of this, this place, we found a church in Brooklyn and dressed it to um, have a, a very similar look. Um, and here's the day one of our shoot where we shot all the rhythm players, and here's uh, day two of the shoot where we shot all the, the lead players. And the kind of um, the color palette and a lot of the mise-en-scene is based on what, what I knew of the, the Columbia studio, but also on uh, the film by Jean-Luc Godard called Sympathy for the Devil, which he documents the Rolling Stones uh, trying over days and days to finish writing the song, which they can't, they can't seem to do until they get the conga player in the room. So, but unlike the kind of um, stifled creativity that we see in the, the Godard film, um, this Lana Cachasse is almost this geyser of music in which we um, see, um, uh, where we see and hear about one and a half hours of unique music and uh, six hours of uh, sequence music, resequenced music over, over time. Because what happened was there was the performance from, from day one of all the rhythm tracks um, was shot separately, obviously, with a very fluid camera, mimicking good, the Godard film, um, was then edited together with the, the lead tracks, which were played back to them. So the first day, the drummer had uh, a click track in her head, 100 beats per minute, works out to um, uh, two seconds, 12 frames per bar. And um, there were those, those tracks, select tra takes were played back to the lead players, and then for the next three months, I worked with an arranger to um, edit this, because the, the, the problem here was that because you, you're seeing the people playing, you couldn't edit, edit until it was arranged, and you couldn't arrange until it was edited. So it was a, the process happened all at the same time. The first four I could do myself, because it was fairly straightforward, but as the key signatures got, got odd, I needed a lot of help from my collaborator, Scott Harring, to, to make this work. Um, so in the end, we have this um, very, it seems, seems very spontaneous, but it was actually constructed much in the same way that Miles was constructing his records at that time. Along with his collaborator, Tio Macero, his producer, um, he typically would record uh, music, uh, improvised music by musicians, then later go back and finish composing it by cutting it with a razor blade. Uh, here's like a, a sample from uh, this work from uh, 2013, uh, Luana Kinshasa. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> so Luana Kachanska was kind of the last of a series of works I call my recombinant works. Uh, the lesson I learned from Overture about making uh, a looping, um, moving pictures in a gallery as a way of dealing with the fact that people walk in randomly at any, any point was elaborated upon by these works where, which no longer sort of dealt with spatial things. Often those works from the 90s were spatializing techniques of cinema, uh, montage, et cetera, uh, synchronization, uh, dubbing. Uh, in this case, uh, in the recombinant works, I was often using a single screen and then having, instead of having complexity in space, I had complexity in time because these things would often transform themselves over time. And in one case, it uh, tell, can tell new stories uh, uh, for a virtually infinite amount of time in a piece called Suspiria from 2003. This work, this, the secret agent, kind of brings those two tendencies together uh, into a, a single piece in which I made an adaptation of the novel The Secret Agent by Joseph Conrad, uh, which was about terrorism in the 19th century when people tried to blow up the Greenwich Observatory um, and with a failed attempt to blow up the Greenwich Observatory and transpose that to 1975, the year after the Portuguese Revolution, where it seemed that the Communist Party was the most likely to take power. And in response to that, the extreme left and extreme right-wing groups uh, began uh, a series of bombings, hijackings, uh, acts of terror, um, exactly the same techniques, which they thought would have very uh, uh, different ends. Um, so it seemed an interesting place to, or interesting time to um, have a meditation on the uh, nature of terror, the technique of terror, which had very different meanings from the 19th century, 1970s, when many European countries were subject to homegrown terror, um, and, and today. Um, this piece is a, a six-channel six video installation with eight channels of audio, and in some ways inspired by a film called The Boston Strangler from 1968 by a filmmaker's maybe first name is Alan Fleischer, anyway. 
um, who had been to um, Expo 67 and saw these multi-screen uh, films and thought that would be a great way of um, making a movie. So in between the fairly straightforward narratives of Tony Curtis and a kind of great performance in the Boston Strength, we, we have these multi-screen vignettes where uh, things are going on simultaneously and the audience is often um, as confused as the people in the city who don't know where this um, terrorizing figure is, like who is he, what is he doing, where are we straight next, and the different screens are very beautifully um, choreographed in terms of the action, which are playing off uh, both uh, pictorially and narratively uh, simultaneously. And they shot that by, to retain quality, they'd mask out the entire part of the 35mm frame and just shoot that one part where the scene would happen, and then shoot the next scene over here, next scene over here, and the comp into one thing later on, the beautifully well-made film. Anyway, I adopt the same idea for the, for the secret agent in which we have six screens. Sometimes they're all on, as in this case, and sometimes there's um, four on, and sometimes there's only two on. But there's always at least two screens going simultaneously, so you're often in the middle of the action. So people are screaming across the space to each other, fighting across the space to each other. A character walks around the space from one location to the other. These are things which are happening constantly in the, in the piece of the secret agent, uh, in which... Uh, our, our, our character, Verloc, has um, um, inadvertently used his stepson um, in the bombing of the uh, Marconi installation at Sisimbra, which is our, the equivalent of the observatory for me, going from uh, the maintenance of time to the maintenance of a network. Um, when his wife finds out um, that uh, he has killed her son, uh, she kills him. And um, that's a very simple narrative. That's why Conrad's subtitle is um, A Simple Tale. And here's a scene from... Uh, the secret agent, which kind of explains what's, um, what the scenario that, that will unfold is going to be like. Um, and remember, you're seeing two screens side by side, but in the installation, you're in between it. You're sort of being you're, um, in between these two scenes. So you have to decide what you want to watch. You're making the montage by where you look, uh, and sometimes surprising things happen around you. So the secret agent from 2015. Seven years ago, you incited French students into acts of sedition. What did you get for that? Nine months in La Santé. It's not so much. Anyway, it serves you right for getting caught. What do you got to say for yourself, Mr. Verloc? I have nothing special to tell you. You summoned me, and here I am, even though it may be dangerous for me. Your comrades are a lazy bunch like you. They're rarely out of bed before noon. Don't worry. Next time, I will come to you. What are you supposed to be, anyway? Anarchist? Desperate communist? Anarchist. So you began your connection with us by inciting insurrection in France. You got yourself arrested and have been here doing nothing for the last seven years. Exactly why did my predecessor give you cover? I am Portuguese. Are you? I was born in Porto, where my father... Never mind explaining. Six years ago, a lot of lazy people were running this organization, and people like you got the wrong idea what this embassy is. I want to correct that misapprehension right now by telling you what it is not. This is not a philanthropic organization. I failed to understand. You understand me perfectly, Mr. Verloc. And as far as I can tell, you have done nothing to earn your salary in the last four years. Now that I am here, you will have to earn your money. No work, no pay. Several times I have prevented... Don't tell me about the old days. The evil is with us now. We don't want prevention. We want a cure. You know there are elections coming up. I do read the papers. Well, Portugal must be brought into line. You will agree with me the middle classes are stupid. They are. They have no imagination. What we need to do is stimulate them with a really good scare. 
What's the most important thing to the Portuguese people, Mr. Verloc? I would say... You don't know because you're too lazy to think. They don't care about royalty or religion. The fascists drove the aristocrats into hiding and the church is tainted along with the old regime. See what I mean? Perfectly. How about the embassies, a series of bobbings directed at... Don't be target. facetious, Verloc. You can blow up all the embassies in Lisbon without influencing the public one bit. The only thing the Portuguese care about now is the future. They never want to be a backward country again. You anarchists hate the status quo, and since bombs are your means of expression, why not bomb modernity itself? What do you think about an assault on communication? Communication. Blow up the Marconi installation at Sazimbra, Mr. Verloc. Sever the umbilical between Europe and the New World. All European telecommunication with America would be disrupted for months. What makes Portugal a modern nation? The colonies it couldn't afford? Its useless industry? It's that braid of copper under the Atlantic, Mr. Verloc. Why else do you think a gang of fascists was welcomed by NATO for the last 25 years? Before the first free elections in half a century, we want a strategy of tension that'll make the middle classes think twice before they vote. A, a difficult proposition. What's the matter? Don't you have your old pathetic cronies at hand? I see that old terrorist Junt almost every day moping around the Jardim de Estrella, and Michaelis, that deranged prophet of Lusitanian doom. You don't expect me to believe you don't know where he is, because if you don't, I will tell you. It would require a lot of money. Oh, fuck you, Verloc. That won't fly. You'll get your allowance and not a penny more until something happens. And if nothing happens, you won't get even that. <clears throat> so, back where we started. Um, a, a, a photo... wait, what's it called? A photogenic drawing by Henry Fox Talbot from 1839. Um, so, of course, this kind of image, the, the photogram, is the thing which preceded photography. Uh, with the aid of an optical apparatus, it became photography as we know it. But then shortly um, after the turn of the century, artists began to experiment with what uh, the nature of the medium was. And many artists associated often with uh, surrealism and constructivism began uh, uh, disengaging the optical aspect from photography and working only with the, uh, that other side of it, the, uh, the capturing of the image with the um, photomechanical process. So I wondered, like, what could I do to sort of ha be in a dialogue with the situation? How could I make a, a 21st century photogram? And I began, like, looking at media in a, in a very ma materialist way. I began looking at photography uh, in detail when I, when I shot that uh, big mural, um, uh, the, the riot photograph, because I had to make a decision, do I shoot this analog or do I shoot it digitally? Um, and in the end, I decided it doesn't really matter what you shoot as long as you have good lenses. If you're like converging light, if you're making an optical image, lenses are the key thing. It doesn't matter what you shoot it on in, in the end, really. But then what about the material of the, the capturing device? Um, because originally, what captured the light in, in the manifold was something photomechanical. Uh, but now, what, what captures and stores, storage is a key thing for photography and reproduction, uh, is not uh, chemistry, but it's actually um, mathematics, it's actually equations, it's actually numbers and formula. So that's the thing I wanted to explore in the, the, the series of work which we see also downstairs, uh, from the corrupt files um, to the, the newest work, the DCTs. As I was shooting Disco Angola and Mid-Century Studio, uh, I would often get sort of overexcited and I'd shoot too many shots at the same time, the back would get overheated, and uh, the, the back would capture an image even though it was not actually ready to, to capture an image. And what it would result were these corrupt files. Uh, which I found to be kind of fascinating, and I began collecting them over time. This is a corrupt file from 2010 when I was shooting um, Mid-Century Studio, and here's one from uh, 2013 when I was shooting uh, uh, Disco Angola. So the question for me was, I mean, I mean, this was wouldn't go very far, I knew, because um, uh, I didn't really want to be stressing my uh, very expensive digital back, and the glitches were something I couldn't control, even though that, I think, is part of the photographic... Uh, one of the great photographic pleasures, so you don't know what will happen until it has actually happened. And part of that uh, surprise is something I, I find fascinating and very gratifying in photography. Um, as a start, I began looking at something called uh, the discrete cosine transform, which is a kind of a fundamental way in which um, uh, images, both moving and still, are encoded in uh, the digital, digital format. 
This is the, all the permutations of what's called the lookup table uh, for a discrete cosine transform used in JPEG, uh, the image um, uh, variety of uh, digital encoding. Basically, what happens is the image is broken into an 8 by uh, 8 macro block. The entire image is broken up into these, these little macro blocks. Each macro block is then uh, compressed via the, the tra transform, looking first at there's first the, the average color of that macro block, and then these different coefficients um, or wave functions are then multiplied into each other until you get the exact copy um, of, of the image. So it's actually much more, um, much more lightweight uh, in terms of uh, numerical value to uh, represent the image. And basically, if they need a, a smaller file, you throw away coefficients until all is left is a, um, a rectangle of a single color. This is what you see when the, um, the stream of your Netflix kind of falls apart and everything turns blocky, eventually goes fuzzy, and then sort of snaps into resolution. This is the process by which it is sort of assembled into a, a new thing. So I wanted to get my hands in this medium um, and began working with uh, my technicians to develop software to allow me to uh, kind of reverse engineer this and encode directly discrete cosine transforms. Um, so what I was doing over time was uh, we sort of began by putting numbers into, um, into um, preference files. That was too, too uh, laborious. Putting numbers into these blocks, that was quite laborious. In the end, I got a, uh, a DJ control service of a, a, a grid of knobs allowing me to quite quickly um, manipulate the uh, amplitude and frequency of the uh, different coefficients that are multiplied together to make the, the transform. So as I was working with this, it became, I found a lot of things were kind of arbitrary, but it also did very surprising things. For example, if you multiply this with this, it kind of makes sense that the result is this. But then other things were confusing to me, like and I noticed different patterns when I would have this multiplied with that, I would get this, which uh, didn't make a lot of sense to me. So I had Peter Kortemarsh, my uh, programmer, to output um, uh, all of the permutations of the, um, these wave functions from uh, a frequency, horizontal frequency, and vertical frequency of 0, 0 over 0, 0 to 12, 12 over 12, 12. And uh, looking at the more interesting patterns, like how does this plus that equal that, which seems is, is kind of surprising in a way. So sifting through these, these files which I got in, just in monochrome, I began trying to find um, patterns which were uh, either symmetrical or uh, quadrosymmetrical, uh, bilateral symmetrical, quadrilateral symmetrical, um, that had some kind of um, visual complexity to them, that had a multiplicity, so it looked like not just a single um, uh, simple two-dimensional image, but somehow looked at it a certain way, be transformed itself into something else, which seemed to be kind of a, the basic property of what these, these things were doing. Um, and over time, I, I mean, my project I gave myself was to first take these uh, 25 basic uh, monochrome uh, DCTs, then do color variations on them uh, later on. I began by you know, adding many, many coefficients to um, basically colorize them, add fades to them, in a way decorate them, and I kind of felt that very unsatisfying. Uh, it didn't click for me until I realized I should do the same thing to the color versions I'm doing with the black and white versions. Look for harmonic relationships that, of interference patterns that would um, sort of be ex expressing the, the nature of the, these harmonics uh, directly. And it was not a matter of adding more and more coefficients to make a, a more and more interesting image. It was a matter about making the most complex image with the, the fewest number of coefficients possible. Something which takes many hours to figure out. It's like a, kind of exhausting doing this because you're, you're both uh, uh, looking at these complex visual images plus doing a lot of math simultaneously. But eventually, it would get to the point where I could make an image like this, which is uh, in the show downstairs, quite complex, uh, but only composed of a very, only four different coefficients are used to uh, produce this image. Um, and then again, the going from a black and white image, which is like this one, and using um, the harmonic differentials between the different uh, color channels to produce an image like that, which is kind of surprising. And I still don't, this is the first one I did that actually uh, clicked. I still don't know how I do it, did it, but it still is something I intend to explore, or how this uh, turned into that, or this transformed into that. And um, yeah, that's my, my latest, latest work, which we'll, we're premiering here in Gothenburg, uh, the discrete cosine transform. Thank you very much.